We're going to start addressing the topic in sports law this year. Um, it is something that has obviously become a focus point for sports lawyers, sports business people, agents, and most importantly, student athletes. Their world has changed, as hopefully everyone knows. And this all sort of accelerated July 1st, right before July 1st, as our law students know, as lawyers know, the Alston case in the Supreme Court that really took a slash at the NCAA, eliminated any restrictions on education-related benefits, and where the NCAA had proposed guardrails for two years working up to July 1st, when some state laws were coming into play for an NIL, the NCAA threw up their hands. And they really left it up to conferences and schools and the states to regulate this. And what we've had, as I'm sure both of our panels coming up will talk about, is we've had the Wild West. It has been all hands on deck for NIL, name, image, likeness, in ways that a lot of us probably never expected. But here we are. And our first panel to talk about this are some people I'm so proud to have here. Just give you their intros right up here on the far right. My friend, Villanova Morad board member from Excel, Vice President of Golf, Kevin Hopkins is here. From Morgan Lewis, Don Schelke, one of our top student athletes at Villanova, who I'll introduce more later, Liam McKinnon on the soccer team. And Cody Wilkinson, graduate here just a couple years ago, 2018. Let's welcome our panel. And you don't want to hear from me all the time asking questions. So what I've done this year, I'm bringing up our students who've done so well at, at our sports law program, who assist me, helping me moderate this one is one of my stars. Austin Mayo is here. There's Austin. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to start with you, Kevin. Love it. <laughs> because that's what you get for being a board member. Perfect. Excel was an agency that represented professional athletes up until last year. Now you're an agency, like all agencies, that are representing college athletes. Talk about generally about the transition. Yeah, it's been, a, uh, it's been an interesting one for sure, and I think we, we needed to make decisions at the beginning um, because we knew legislation was coming up, and uh, I think we learned pretty quickly you're either, you, you can't go one foot into it. If you're going to get into the NIL space, you need to be all in. Um, and so I, our core pillars uh, at Excel from a sports perspective are golf, baseball, basketball, and football. And I think, depending on who you speak with in each of those uh, in each of those verticals, uh, some either love NIL, and I'll be on that. I've seen the positive side of it from a golf perspective, which is where I work. Um, and there are some who are probably frustrated with it. If you talk to our our NFL talent representation uh, from a basketball representation side of things as well, it's um, it's changed and it's changed quickly. Um, I, I think when we decided to jump in. We wanted to make sure we did it the right way, which I'm, I'm super happy about. I don't know if AT is still here, but we actually hired uh, one of your former superstars here from the law school uh, to head up our NIL legal practice. Uh, and, and we needed it from the beginning, just from a compliance perspective, understanding the different laws and, and regulations from school to school and state to state. Um, so from my perspective, you know, what I would tell you is um, – from a recruiting side of things where I, I represent golfers uh, on, on the men's and the women's side, um, it has moved our timelines up, you know, where typically we would wait until players were ready to turn professional, try and set the meetings with the coaches or the, the influential people in their lives um, to, to pitch our business and our services. Um, it's moved those timelines up, and we're now having to, to place resources well in advance. You're, you're trying to project out as far in advance as you can to how successful can this player be, how marketable can this player be. Uh, and uh, as the, the big bad agent on, on the panel up here, uh, what I can tell you is it, I've also seen the successes of it. I, I think I've seen 
the warning signs, uh, and, and I think I've seen a few of the, um, the different groups who are involved where uh, there's certainly caution for the student athletes in, in the world that I would, um, uh, I would certainly caution them, but I've also seen, you know, I think the good side of NIL and for the people that have been um, really harping on, you know, giving these student athletes the opportunity uh, to capitalize on who they are and, and their talents. Thanks, Kevin. And for those who don't know, I undersold him. He, if you've watched the match, starting with Tiger versus Phil, then Tiger and Tom versus Peyton and Phil, and on and on, here's the brainchild. Tom Brady's called me baby too, but he hasn't given me the, uh, <laughs> the, the hands on the face yet. The big hands, the close talking. Don. From a litigation point of view, from a legal point of view, what are you working on with NIL? What issues come up? Yeah, I mean, the deals that you're seeing out there are deals that have been around for a long time. They're effectively sponsorship deals. But what you're seeing is um, new opportunity, people being, you know, uh, aggressive in chasing talent that's a lot, you know, younger and, and, and a lot you know, more premature, it, it, it's, I wouldn't say premature, that are at an earlier stage in their professional or, or, or athletic career. Um, and, and you're seeing the, you know, a lot of folks out there trying to, you know, push and make sure that those younger folks um, are protected. So there's the one side where they're protected, but then at the also side, making sure that they're still getting the economic benefits that are out there. And so you're just seeing a lot of corporate activity that's interested in chasing these deals, but wanting to do so responsibly, I would say. And certainly not in a way that would jeopardize, um, you know, eligibility and those types of things. So you're getting a lot of questions from um, you know, particularly the corporate side in my practice. I'm a, I'm a deal lawyer. I'm a transactional lawyer. So I, 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 I write contracts for these types of things. The contracts themselves are very similar to what you see, but the focus around um, the public awareness of it, it, you know, sort of heightens the stakes, if that makes sense. Thank you. Liam, I'm going to say this and don't take offense, but Colin Gillespie was supposed to be in your chair. Yeah, I heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> and Jay Wright, they're a little busy this weekend. But welcome. And I undersold Liam as well. Listen, this guy, I'm reading it here, he has produced the most goals by a Wildcat since 2015. It's pretty impressive. In one season. And you've got some NIL deals. Now, you come in as one of our top soccer players, all Big East, you hear about this name image likeness, then what happens? Well, at first it was a little surprising because <laughs> as you mentioned, it all happened really fast last summer and we didn't really get any warning about it. Um, after my sophomore year, um, nobody told me that that was gonna happen really. And uh, when we heard about it, um, we, heard, uh, we had a meeting with uh, Ashwin Puri, who was our athletic director for soccer. And um, so he kind of explained it to us that there wasn't any real legislation yet. Um, at least it was made by the conferences and the states. And uh, so I really didn't pay attention to it because first of all, as a soccer player in America, it's not, I mean, I know the main fo focus is not on, on soccer. I know it's, it's mostly for football and basketball. So I was more focused on, on our fall season coming up. And I just thought that if, if deals were gonna happen, they would just come to me and I wasn't really looking for it. And as we started doing well, um, some deals um, came up and, and companies reached out. And, um, but again, it wasn't, it wasn't really a focus at first. It was just something that kind of surprised us all. And, and yeah, that's how I ended up getting some deals, but I wasn't, um, it wasn't the main focus at first. And I'll ask you about those deals in a minute. Cody Wilkinson, star alum from a few years ago. Loved having you in my classes. And you've seen what we've developed since you've been here. Um, and now you're working in the space. You're working in name, image, likeness. You've been writing about it. I've been reading your work. Tell us about what you're doing with the space. Yeah, so as, as NIL developed, um, 
you know, in the middle part of last year and moving into the fall, um, you know, Blank Rome as a firm wanted to kind of um, figure out what it is, what our role could be, where a law firm is needed. Um, so we just started asking questions, talking to athletic directors, talking to athletes, talking to coaches, talking to agents. Um, and what we came to discover is that one of the great parts of the interim policy in each of the state laws is that student athletes are now allowed to have professional representation, but by and large, the deals were not significant enough economically for them to actually have that representation. And particularly at the localized level, in your non-traditional revenue sports, student athletes were signing deals uh, without professional representation. And in many of those cases, those deals were signed without someone with a, a bar license ever looking at it. From the brand side, when you talk about car dealerships or local restaurants, things like that, they're pulling an agreement off of the internet. Right. And they're Google. piecing it together. I call them frank agreements because they're just you know bits and pieces stuck together. And they... They contained a lot of inappropriate provisions. Even you know some of the big brands, they were kind of the first out there. They put together an agreement based on an independent contractor agreement that that was not appropriate for a college athlete. And so we started with um, education pieces, trying to work with universities to educate their student athletes to empower them to review their own deals and know, you know, if I see uh, exclusive rights, I need to put up a red flag. If I see in perpetuity, I need to put up a red flag. Um, modification of my image, things like that, um, where they just need to be careful before they sign the deal um, and, and seek help, whether that's from their athletic department, an agent, an attorney, whatever that is. That has now transitioned. We've now, you know, we're representing some of the NIL marketplaces, uh, collectives, brands, and advising them on the same issues, though, making sure the deals that student athletes are signing are protecting them. We work with one of the marketplaces on reviewing their agreements to make sure agreements that, that go through their portal are putting athletes in the best position to monetize their rights, protect themselves down the line. Um, so it's been, it's very rewarding, but it's very education based um, with everything we're doing with each of the constituents in the marketplace. The Wild West. <laughs> the absolute Wild West. So, Cody, you you, talk, you heard Lyme also talk about kind of how NIL kind of came out of nowhere, right? Like July 1st, and for a lot of student-athletes, it was a bit of a surprise. Um, and obviously, the interim NIL policy from the NCA perspective only came, frankly, hours right before. But now it seems that many states are thinking about repealing or severely amending. We saw it in Alabama. Florida is considering it as well. So these leaders that put the pressure on are almost now considering that it's not even worth having an NIL law pretty much at all. So can you kind of talk about the advantages and disadvantages of working in states with NIL laws versus ones that don't have them at all? Yeah. Um, so obviously, I, I, Maine um, sent their bill to their governor uh, a couple days ago, which I think would be the 29th state. Um, which is great, and, and the, the original legislation, starting with California, Florida, those states was um, you know, really, really forward thinking. They wanted to provide these opportunities to the student athletes before Alston, before the interim policy, and so they felt if they put these laws in place, they would be helping and providing a new benefit to student athletes. Well, interim policy goes in place. States that don't have legislation, those student athletes are virtually unregulated. Um, that means the universities are unregulated and what they're able to do on behalf of their student athletes. Even, uh, you know, a lot of the states have um, very loose provisions that don't put a ton of guardrails on university. You see, like Ohio State, right? Ohio State has a program where they actually have employees of their athletic department that are soliciting and working on NIL deals for their student athletes. And then you see a state like Tennessee where the Tennessee legislation says the university can't have any involvement. They can't solicit, they can't review it, they can't have any participation. So, so student athletes at University of Tennessee, Vanderbilt, East Tennessee State, they are on their own. Um, that's a huge, huge disadvantage from, one, protecting your student athletes, but also a recruiting standpoint, right? University of Tennessee athletes versus University of Alabama athletes who just repealed their law Alabama can sort of do anything they want within the realm of appropriateness. You can't do pay for play. You can't just hand over money. Um, but they can work with their student athletes to make sure they're getting deals, 
good deals, review agreements, all those types of things. And so it's really become a huge benefit to either not have a state law or have a not very restrictive state law. Um, and it is it has created an uneven playing field sort of across the country. And, and Don, obviously you're an expert more on the licensing side of things, but um, Cody was touching on a couple of state laws. I know Connecticut, for example, um, is very restrictive when it comes to what uh, schools will allow in terms of their word marks and their teams and stuff. And if you just look at UConn, uh, their women's basketball team um, have a couple athletes, obviously in the final four this year, um, that you know can't actually advertise themselves in their uniforms. They have to blank it out. So how is it navigating basically the space where you have to deal with certain laws where they can't have those word marks and everything versus other ones that the schools pretty much give free, free reign to the athletes. Yeah, like a lot of things when you're a lawyer, it really depends on who your client is and who you're representing. Because like in some instances, having the state law there is an advantage for major players coming into the market. There's a degree of certainty. They feel they could do longer term deals. They can, and that's not, this is not to get, it's just a counterpoint to another way of looking at the exact same thing. When you're looking at, you know, companies like Nike and Adidas, the, the, the purpose of these deals is to promote their brand and negative publicity is, you know, not the best for them. And so what they want to do is, is understand these rules. And so my suspicion is, is that as, or my, 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 I guess my, my prediction is, is that, you know, those states that have, um, you know, that are following closely to the California law or following sort of the one that's most developed, as developed as you can be in the wild, wild west, uh, those ones will, will attract the most real corporate dollars coming into them. And it will create a, um, a, you know, a balance to, 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 to sort of push the laws in the other states along and move the ones that are, that are consistency. So what I think we're going to see is a little bit of a, a, aside from a few outlier areas, you're going to see a general deregulation and a general kind of, um, you know, stabilizing of this, this stuff. As people try to catch up, they see where the big money's chasing, and then you'll see sort of the laws follow that and, and these different things that are coming through. That's my anticipation, because what, what the questions I'm getting are largely from, you know, corporate sponsors that want to get into the space, not at the, at the schools, you know, answering, you know, how do we handle it? They're saying, you know, how do we get into this? What do we leverage? Some of the new technologies we'll talk about, you know, later in the presentation, but, but that, that's what I'm saying. Kevin and, and Liam, there's so much in the news about the big football deals and the basketball deals, and even Coach Wright has been texting me about all these deals that are coming up for players. But you're working in golf and soccer. What have you seen in the golf world, and, and certainly on the recruiting side, but on the maintenance side as well, with your clients? I've been pleasantly surprised, um, is what I would say. I think uh, so. I represent the the top two female golfers in the world. Uh, a girl named Ro Zhang, who's 18 years old, freshman at Stanford, uh, and her teammate Rachel Heck, who's a sophomore at Stanford, ranked number one, number two in the world. And I think anybody in this room, if you were to ask. Um, you generally what you thought they may be uh, earning off their name, image, and likeness, I think you would be shocked by, by what is actually happening. Um, and I think it's a combination of things. I think anytime you've got the right talent, uh, but also I think the influx of support to, uh, and, and spending in women's sports uh, contributes to that as well. I think the fact that tomorrow on NBC they're playing at Augusta National uh, in their biggest amateur event of the year, um, is part of it, and I think it's somewhat of the sexiness of brands wanting to get into the NIL space right now uh, to capitalize on it. Anytime you see a deal that gets done, it's you know on the front page of Sports Business Journal and getting some headlines and, and attracting news to social media. So what I'll tell you is I've, I've been really pleasantly surprised and seen the success uh, both from an endemic side of things with, you know, golf club manufacturers and, and apparel partners, but the non-endemic space as well, whether they've got finance partners, they've, you know, they're, they're, represent, they're ambassadors for asset management groups and um, Beats by Dre. I've been trying to get a Beats by Dre deal done in the LPGA space for 15 years, and it wasn't until NIL came along where they were like, hey, we'll create these custom headphones 
for both your girls to wear down in Augusta. Um, so it's also a really cool and, and creative, um, for me, it's different. It's different than what I've done over the last 15 years of, of representing talent. Um, but you're starting to see brands uh, who are, are figuring out the right way to take advantage of it. So I've been pleasantly surprised there, but I, I also think there's a difference between talent capitalizing on their name, image, and likeness and some of the collectives that we've seen, which are, are basically glorified, you know, what has happened over the last few decades of boosters yeah. who were doing things illegally or in the background. So I, I think there's kind of two sides to it, um, and I'm happy to be on, on the side to see the athletes who, who are deserving of, uh, you know, earning money now based on who they are versus, you know, an inducement to go play for a certain school which I think is what the, the latter is. Yeah, we're going to talk about directives, collectives, the booster side of it. A little here, but with get, the next... Get your NIL bingo cards out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Liam, tell us about your deals. Um, so I've had um, I have a couple of real um, concrete deals, and right now I'm working on my third deal. Um, so I don't have an agent for, for that. I'm just working by myself. Do or don't? Not yet, Lime. <laughs> um, so You're going to have um, a tough time getting out of here with all these <laughs> aspiring agents. <laughs> but um, so what, can, what I can say about uh, the two deals that I've had before. So the very first one was uh, with a company um, that's called Vital Proteins. So it was basically just um, products that it would send me. Um, against social media posts, and um, I would get a part of the revenue that they would make from my promo code, and that was basically it. And the other one that was uh, much more interesting for me um, was the performance meal prep deal, um, which is a meal company for athletes. And uh, I know there's, I think, two or three basketball players. Uh, I know um, Jermaine has the same deal. Um, and this company is really focused on making meals for, for elite athletes. And so basically everything is measured, protein, uh, carbs, everything will be measured for the athlete. And um, so I got a deal with that company. And so that was during our season. And that really helped me because um, I was making maybe the same profit as with the vital proteins ones, maybe like a 20% or 15% um, of their sales with my promo code, but the real benefit that I had with that with that deal was um, so the meals. So so that benefit was huge because I went from eating um, whatever at the dining hall or cooking at my apartment to <laughs> whatever <laughs> whatever <laughs> whatever was served at the dining hall to something that really benefited me on the field and also boosted my performances. And um, I think for sports like soccer, lacrosse, baseball, that are not sports like um, football or basketball, where um, the revenue is not going to be the main focus, I think for athletes, the, the main focus should be get a deal where you're going to benefit from the products you're going to get. And I think it, it also gives me access to a lot of, um, a lot of products that I, I would never purchase on my own. So, for example, I would never go by myself and target these brands to, to get, a, for example, like a meal or protein or supplements, organic supplements. I would never go out of my way to do that. And I think um, this is an underestimated value for, for these sports because I hear a lot of, oh, NIL is just for basketball and football. But there's also a real benefit for, for smaller sports in America today. And um, so that was my first um, focus. And how did, they, how did those deals come to you? So like I said, um, at first I wasn't really trying to get those deal. I wasn't reaching out to any companies. And um, I remember after a game we had against Yale, um, we, won, we won the game at home 2-1. Um, and I was lucky enough to score a nice goal. And I think... Two, three days after, um, I got, I think, three emails from, from no, two emails and uh, um, an Instagram message from companies. And uh, one of the emails was the performance meal prep um, company. And uh, also we can see that it's a good way for athletes to 
kind of transfer their performances into profit or or at least benefit from from these companies because I would say that before NIL it was we were really dependent on the end of our college career so like we could play great freshman year sophomore year junior year and then if your senior year you something happens to you or you know you you don't perform as, as you don't perform as well injury yeah injuries um if you disappear from the picture, from the from the big picture, well, it can be kind of a wasted three years behind you um, if you don't sign a pro contract. So we're really reliant on on our last years, especially. And I think that what, what NIL brings to to the to to student athletes is that even though we still want to get a pro contract at the end, we can also benefit from good performances in freshman year, good performance in sophomore year. And um, so, yeah, that, that was, that's how it happened at first. Now, Cody, if he came to you with a contract, what are you looking for from the player side? What are you looking for from the brand side? Yeah, from the player side, we're, we're making sure that they are protecting their rights. And, and you're talking about, you know, um, how well you play for two seasons or three seasons or four seasons. There's kind of two ways to look at it. You, there are deals that, that are, you know, multiple seasons, multiple years if you want to lock in your value. But uh, we're also counseling athletes to really restrict and limit the, the time periods of these deals. And many of them are social media related deals. So it's five posts or two posts or whatever that looks like. But, but now that there are some sponsorship opportunities that are, you know, sort of longer term and brands are looking into lock in student athletes, well, your value as a uh, all freshman team person is something, yeah. but if you continue that trajectory, what is your value the following year? What is the value the third year? You know, is your value going to continue to grow? And did you did you leave money on the table? Did you leave opportunity on the table? Um, so we've been pushing to restrict deals to one competition season, one academic year, really define it in that way. Or if the value is right, of course, you know, sign. But make sure that it is limited to your time as a college athlete. Um, you're not giving up any professional opportunities. You're not entering into a deal that is requiring professional um, representation past um, your time in college. And then, you know, past that, it's it's what I was getting to, into before is is about the provisions of you know, not giving up exclusive rights, not giving up rights in perpetuity, um, things like uh, choice of law provisions that you learn about in, in contracts while you're sitting here is if a student athlete is 19 years old and they are sitting in Villanova, Pennsylvania signing a deal and the deal requires them, if they want to um, contest any part of that, that they have to sue in Florida or California or somewhere else, that's sort of a a complete barrier to challenge the agreement. If you want to claw back some of your rights, if you want to terminate the deal, um, you, if you file suit in Pennsylvania, they're going to move to dismiss. It's going to get dismissed based on the choice of law provision. Um, that's not really appropriate for college athletes. There are certain states that have um, in their state laws require. If your athlete is doing the NIL deal here, they have to have access to the court system here. Same thing with arbitration provision. Um, arbitration provision prevents you from going just directly to the courthouse and it, it's going to force you to incur money um, to get that. And when you're talking about a lower level deal that gave away high level rights, um, it, it's really problematic. So making sure the athlete is protected on that side. And then from the other side, we are counseling brands to put the best interest of the athlete forward. Um, you know, you talked about publicity and the brands wanting publicity. You know what's a really bad publicity? If a student athlete comes out and says, hey, we had this issue, we want to get out of the deal, and they said, here's this contract, no. Um, so just making sure it protects both sides, the, the rights are clean, termination is clean, both sides should be able to get out with notice, um, even if that requires paying back some of the money, but, but just that the, the rights are clean um, and protected, it's well papered, well defined. 
Kevin, representing golfers, um, certainly it's a little bit different than representing, you know, basketball players and football players. Um, it seems like there are a couple more natural sponsorship opportunities with clubs and apparel and everything. In terms of how Excel's kind of managing their, their talent, do you find that managing golfers is very different than managing uh, a football player, a basketball player, both with the acquisition of getting the talent to be the NIL representation, but then also getting them deals as well? Yeah, but a hundred percent. So I, golf, I think, is uniquely situated to to capitalize on NIL, and I think for a few reasons. So the players that I represent are going to turn professional at some point. Um, but even this summer, they're going to play in high-profile amateur events and professional events as amateurs, um, where now they can wear a hat and they can put a logo on a shirt and they can, you know, represent a, a, an equipment brand and, and, um, and who knows, they could go perform really well and it'll be on NBC or CBS. And so you can, you can go with a real pitch to a company to say, Hey, you're not just supporting these young women or men. Uh, but you also have the ability to, to have some high profile branding opportunities there. The other thing that golf gives you is um, the ability to actually play with these with these players, right? So, um, in most of the deals that I have for uh, for my two clients, uh, it includes a golf outing, you know, where these people can go. And, you know, we've got a few deals with Stanford alums where they're going to have an outing at the Olympic Club and they're going to bring in the number one and number two ranked amateurs in the world, um, and that's a selling point for them. Um, and they can do that at a much more cost-effective rate than going to try and do a deal right now with a PGA Tour or an LPGA Tour player. Um, but yet get the same impact from it. So, so golf is unique in that aspect um, because from a basketball side, you know, Colin is, is one of Excel's clients, um, you know, but you're not, you know, Colin's not giving clinics or going out and shooting hoops with, you know, any of the companies that he's doing deals with. For the most part, they're mostly social you know, meet and greets, um, you know, things along those lines for, for what he can do. So golf is certainly different. Um, we've been lucky to, to be able to, to capitalize on it and be at the forefront of it. Uh, but we've seen some serious value uh, in being able to, to use the sport uh, to be in front of brands and, and get them involved. Kevin, do you think your two women at Stanford are going to stay at Stanford longer because of NIL? So that's where I'll tell you is the benefit. So Rojang is the Terminator. She's unbelievable at golf. Just, I mean, she, she's the only player to go undefeated in her fall season in the history on men's or women's. Tiger went to Stanford. He didn't do that. She won her first four tournaments that she played. She's unbelievable. Um, without NIL, and, and this is just me speaking, knowing her, there's not much more she can win from an amateur perspective um, other than a national championship with Stanford. And um, without NIL, I think that you know, everybody comes from different backgrounds, um, has, has different financial means. Um, there wouldn't have been much more for her to, to win uh, without her parents or somebody on her side saying, it's probably time for you to turn professional, you know, whether it's after your fall season of your freshman year or after your freshman year. Um, Rose has six figures in her bank account now. And, you know, the pressures that you have of saying, you know what, I can compete out there against the best players in the world at a professional side of things. They're no longer there. And, and so she would be one of those examples that I would say is it's a winner across the board. It's a winner for Rose. It's a winner for the brands that are associated with Rose. It's a winner for Stanford because the reality is that she's probably going to stay another year now. I would imagine she probably stays through her sophomore year because she loves the college experience. She's growing, she's making friends, um, and now she doesn't have to worry about what she's potentially missing out on. And while the numbers when she does turn professional are going to be 4X, 5X, 10X, whatever it's going to be based on how good she is, there's not that immediate pressure for her to do that. So, you know, the, the benefits of it, if I'm, if I'm Ann Walker, who's the coach of the, the Stanford women's team, you know, I can now go to the next Rojang, you know, the, the 15, 16 years old, you know, year olds that are out there who are potentially considering maybe turning professional early and say, there's not a, there's not pressure on that side. We, we have now seen success stories where you can come here, enjoy the college experience, you know, learn what it's like to play as a, uh, on a team, 
um, but also be able to capitalize uh, off of it off the golf course. So uh, no doubt about it that Rose will be sticking around longer than you know she may have before that. And I think you'll see that across other sports um, if they do a good job and do it with the right people. So yeah, 100% I would say. Um, Cody, earlier Kevin mentioned that the timeline for athletes is moving further and further forward, right? And now one of the big issues, particularly in the last couple months, has been high school NIL. Um, we saw Quinn Ewers go to Ohio State, leave Texas early because Texas didn't allow high schoolers to capitalize off their NIL. He since has already transferred to Texas University now and will be quarterbacking there after taking just a few snaps right at Ohio State. So high school NIL legislation hasn't really caught up just yet. Um, can you talk a little bit about like if you think that market is going to change and if you're going to see how at college NIL really the states are repealing but for high school NIL the states might actually have to legislate? Yeah uh, I think you're absolutely right is is the high school legislation is greatly lacking behind. Um, there's a lot of unknown the states that have allowed it. Um, high school student athletes are starting to profit um, and so I think the states are going to have to act, um, but there's also, you know, th what rights do you want, what, and not to say that they shouldn't, but you're talking now, you're going to be talking about 17, 16, 15 year old kids. I mean, the big shocking news, right, in the NIL world the last couple of weeks was the $8 million collective deal, right, Stuart Mandel's article in the Atlantic, or the Athletic, I apologize, um, that a high school junior signed a deal giving away all his exclusive rights through his college career, potentially worth up to $8 million, uh, that, that that student, is, a high school student, is making their college choice um, based on this collective's actions, and they're from a state that allows high school athletes to do that, and it has sort of created this recruiting mechanism. Now, whether that's an acceptable thing or not is, is to, to be seen, but... Um, that is going to become a thing. This, this was the first one to do it. It was stunning. Um, whether it's appropriate or not is, is definitely to be seen. Um, it's not appropriate. It's, it's not. Yeah. I mean, it's I a, I, in, my, in my opinion, that's a, against the spirit of what this policy was supposed to be. Absolutely. And, and the Quinn example is a, I mean, I think it's a ridiculous loophole for somebody to say, okay, I'm going to end high school early, enroll at Ohio State, put the practice jersey on for six months, you know, take two backup snaps and then go be where I really wanted to be at Texas and be a quarterback. And in the meantime, make, I don't know, I mean, there were reports of hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. I mean, it's, it's an outrageous, I, I don't think that's the spirit of what this should be, at least in my opinion. It's not. This is absolutely not within the spirit of it. The, the $8 million deal that, that everyone's talking about is about as close to, pay for play without calling it pay for play or an inducement. It's certainly a recruiting inducement without calling it a recruiting inducement. But, um, you know, as lawyers, as a litigator, it doesn't have to say it's a recruiting inducement to be one. You know, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it, it's duck. Um, I, hope, I we, hope he goes to a different school. But how do we regulate that? And we're going to talk about this more with the next panel, too. How do we regulate that? The NCA has basically thrown up their hands, like, they're cowed by the Alston case. They're cowed by antitrust. What do we do? Well, I guess one question is, is should we regulate it? I mean, just thinking of it, what you're seeing like globally outside of sports is an optimization of like personal assets and talents. And you, you look at it, even something as simple as Uber and, and VRBO and all these places, what they're doing is they're taking individual talents and assets and they're eroding the barriers for those to go to the public and to commercialize those. And what you're seeing is, is you know, we're talking about it in an athlete's context, but there are 14 year olds making six figures selling slime videos out there as influencers. And you know, I mean, so- Sounds like someone bought them. Yeah. Right, so, so you think about it and, and you think about what's going on and the, you know, my, I guess it's, it's not, my personal view is, it's young to be making those decisions that can dramatically import it. And I have four children, so I understand the gravity of that. I'm not looking past it. But also, there's a bubble that's going on. It is cool to do NIL deals. It's cool to do these kinds of deals. 
and unless they see returns on these kinds of deals. And you're also dealing with kids who will make bad decisions and they will make decisions like what you just said is go to a different school. It won't take many times before people change their mind and do these things before the market corrects. And so we are in the wild, wild west. I wouldn't want to see over-regulation of something that's out there. We, you know, you can't swim upstream against the trend that's happening. That's, you know, the point of this conference is about empowerment and empowerment of athletes. But there's an empowerment of the individual movement that goes long beyond you know, beyond this, and the types of deals we're talking about for the athletes are effectively influencer deals that are being just ported into the athlete space. And what you're going to see is athletes leveraging their their talents to become influencers and, and, and to do this. And that could be career opportunities that maybe aren't necessarily in in athletics. And so I would say that you know, when we look at that deal going on and we think about it in the context of athletics and competitiveness, that's one thing. But if it was a 14-year-old selling slime videos and you weren't the jealous type, you'd say good for her, you know, good for her, it's good for him doing, going out there and putting that stuff together. So I, I just want to add that layer on as sort of a different layer. Of well, I think that depends what your definition of college sports is. I think that's a bigger discussion for the next panel. What, where are we going with this? And is there, should there be a difference between college and pro in terms of monetization for the, the talent pool? Well, I, I saw the other day, uh, Mac Brown was on the Rich Eisen show and he had a, a really um, interesting statement about it. And Jay Billis said something similar and he's been a huge proponent of, of NIL and breaking it down, but essentially that amateurism as we see it, at least in, co in college football and basketball is dead. Um, and so Mac Brown, who, you know, by all reports has, you know, done things the right way, or at least tried to, um, is now up against it from a coaching perspective and a recruiting perspective, because people are going in, into his office and saying, well, you know, I was told if I go to this school, I'm going to make seven figures. Um, and so one of the things that he said was, how do we regulate this? And is it, is there a salary cap? And do we just not pretend, you know, at this point that, um, you know, to, to do things the right way and just say, all right, we've got this amount of money that we're going to be able to put towards it. It was super interesting. I don't know what's right. I'm glad that I'm not in the, in the football basketball space right now, because I think there's probably a lot of, uh, moral lines that are being drawn, uh, and potentially crossed as well. It's funny because the agent side, I'm talking to football and basketball agents like, Hey, Andrew, we always got blamed. Now it's not us. Right, like it's not us supporting these athletes. Well, so so I I talked to one of our partners at the firm who you know he represents some of the best NFL you know Peyton and Eli and Trevor Lawrence and all these others and you know his view on it now is he was able to go to you know build those relationships over their college careers but watch them for four years or three years and see just how talented they were you know were they going to get drafted in, in the first round. And from his perspective now is there are so many agencies and people who are going with briefcases and, and telling them when they're 15 years old, you know, a, a freshman, sophomore, junior in high school. And like, you know, with Trevor Lawrence, we were able to go, you know, five, six months before he, you know, declared and, and was drafted number one overall you know, explain what our services would be and, and why we would be the right fit for them. And now it's these people who are going in way early, trying to earn trust, probably won't earn that trust. Um, and with kids who probably won't pan out to be the next Trevor Lawrence. So it's a really interesting side from a recruiting perspective too. Yeah. Lime, Kevin mentioned, uh, you know, coaches. There are some people out there, even in the space, that are a bit critical of NIL. And one of the concerns when this was first coming up was that it would be a distraction for athletes, particularly in athletes in season. Can you talk about getting deals and perhaps in season versus off season, and kind of how do you manage that while also being a student athlete? So it can definitely be a, a distraction, especially if the brands are not are not targeted for the athlete. Um, I mean, don't target the benefit of the athlete. Um, for example, I remember when um, the NIL um, legislation came out and um, that all the students as the athletes were allowed to, um, to have deals. I remember uh, Barstool came out with this huge statement 
we're running a, a student athlete NIL uh, agency. Um, all D1 student athlete, you can sign up, we get free merchandise. It was just something that came out of nowhere and we were all like, should we do it? And then me and my roommates were talking about it and we were like, maybe bar stool is not the best look for a student athlete. And as we were thinking, we, we saw all these, these athletes signing up and, and, and getting free stuff from Barstool. And, and as it went, I would say maybe half of them just got out of it. And I think these kind of deals can be a source of maybe worry during the season because if you're worrying about oh, my, my image is not what it should be, or maybe if I'm trying to get a pro contract after, maybe that's not the best look. I think these are most the biggest issues, I would say. But managing a normal deal during the season is not, I would say, is not too challenging. Maybe, I mean, in my case, it was, it was, only, it was only posts. So I, I don't think it's too hard of a job to, <laughs> to post something on Instagram. Um, Do you write the posts or they write it for you? So that was one of the topics of discussion. So when I signed my first deal with um, Performance Meal Prep, um, I wanted to dictate what I, what I post. And at first they were like, no, we want something uh, this long with you say, thank you, whatever. And then I was like, no, I, I want to I say something that I decide because um, same, I really didn't know how to shape my image at, at, at first. And when I was thinking about those deals, I was thinking, how do you make the most out of this opportunity without jeopardizing your image? And obviously they didn't ask anything too crazy, but I was also thinking about other deals. Um, if I say, for example, in a post that um, they have exclusive rights on my image or whatever, uh, other, other companies can be like, oh, we're not gonna approach them. And I wanted to really have a lot of power on what I post, when I post it, so that was maybe the, the only, I would say, subject of negotiation and or distraction. But I would say it's a pretty easy task as long as you don't have too many. I would say I only had two or three at the time. But um, obviously if you have 15 deals at, at once and before the game you have to post something, after the game you have to post something, um, it can be challenging, I'm sure. You say you have another deal in the works? Sorry? Do you have a third deal, you say? Yeah, yeah. Can right. you talk about it? Um, I mean, I haven't signed it, or, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I, I, don't know, I don't know if I can, but... Um, Break it's, news? <laughs> no, it's nothing. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not calling Gillespie, obviously, <laughs> so I don't have any, any crazy news for you, but it's a, it's a supplements company that um, I was actually already a consumer, and um, they, they reached out. Um, I mean, that was pure luck for me, but they reached out recently um, to ask me if I wanted to, to do some partnerships with them. But um, I think also that that's one element that's, that's really important. Um, the previous deals that you had influence the future deals that you're gonna have. Because as I said, if you're a Barcelona athlete, um, I know people that got hit up by um, alcohol companies or, or I don't know, other vaping companies or whatever all companies that are not, I would say, great looks for, for, for a student athlete, especially a division one athlete. But um, I was lucky enough to sign healthy deals, I would say, I would call them. And this is in, right now I'm collecting the benefit of it because I'm getting offers from, from protein companies, supplement companies, um, all stuff that I'm gonna benefit from from an athletic standpoint. And we were making light of it earlier, but do you, do you want or need an agent? Or are you comfortable doing this yourself? Well, that's the, that's the thing. Um, uh, I actually recall um, being at one of your conferences and asking you about um, what do you think about having an agent early on? Because um, being from Switzerland, where soccer is our main sport, um, since I was maybe 13 or 14, uh, I had agents calling my dad. Um, after games and and so I was really educated in a way where my dad was always say no, wait, wait, say no, do it yourself or don't do it, but don't let um, don't let outside interest influence your 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 career. And right now, um, being 22, 
I think I'm ready to have some someone to you know to take care of, of, of my deals. Also because I just don't think I have the the knowledge to control to control what, what I sign up for. Um, that's why I'm limited I'm limiting the amount um, of deals that I do because I also want to limit the risk of making a mistake. You've done a great job. Let's give him applause. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> also, I was going to say, sounds like a good opportunity for like a pro bono clinic for some student athletes to have some law students, you know, be, get get versed in looking right. at those and look at that. That sounds like something that some law schools should look into for sure. And Don, I want to ask you before we run out of time, we've talked a lot about one three letter acronym, NIL. You work on another one that is so popular right now, NFT and NFTs for for everyone's non-fungible tokens. Can you talk about that maybe relating it to this space? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's important because, um, so what you're seeing is what, what NFTs allow you to do is in the sports world, at least sell digital collectibles. And the key there is there's a very low barrier to entry. Um, it's really, there's, you know, if you look at the equivalent of like a baseball card to get a baseball card made, you have to reserve a line time in a printing thing. You need color inks. It's expensive and there needs to be a large market to support mass production and the scale that it's required to create those types of collectibles. Uh, what NFT technology does is it allows you to create a digital collectible that anyone can really do for very, very low uh, dollar values, essentially a revenue share. So there's very little upfront commitment other than signing up, for instance, players. And what it allows is a lot smaller markets to compete in the collectible space. Uh, I'll say for why people buy digital collectibles. That's a different, that's a different topic, but I, trust me, people do as, as much as you think. Why would they? They do, and they spend a lot of money on them. And what you'll see is, uh, I think, people leveraging the ease of use, the economics of creating NFTs, and the economics of you know, athletes and, and student athletes that are not in, you know, the number one college recruit in the country going to the pros, but at a team level, someone coming in and being able to sign up all the members of a team for a digital collectible that alumni would like, that, that, that would be a targeted audience for school fans and those types of things at a reasonable price. It, it's, it's just too easy of technology for that not to happen. And we've already seen folks doing that at the high school level, for instance, creating these parents buy them much like you would, you know, your old coffee mug with your pin or your pin, things like that. And so what I see is that type of thing. And then, you know, what will likely happen is a series of consolidation and, and that type of thing before they get value. So I definitely see uh, the NFT space being relevant for um, uh, student athletes, particularly those student athletes that don't get those big deals because it'll just, there'll, there'll just be money to be made there and the economics work out. And Kevin, we have to bring up Colin. You brought him up. What deals have you worked on? Have you guys worked on for Colin? And I guess the question is how dependent is his performance in the final four on future deals and, well, I mean, future deals from an NIL perspective, he's unless he has like right. 12th year eligibility at this point, <laughs> I don't know uh, what we'd be able to do. But, you know, it's been pretty cool because he's, you know, going into the season, he was obviously going to be one of the uh, projected players of the year, um, obviously uh, Big East player of the year. And, and I think for us, and, and while we were late, I think when we, when we signed Colin, um, he was still able to capitalize on it. So I think we saw Outback Steakhouse, they did a pretty cool program in the fall. Um, and I would say they're one of the brands that actually has done this the right way where they targeted, you know, hey, we're gonna go get teammates on, on both the men's and the women's side. Uh, and they did that. So we didn't just do an Outback deal with Colin, we did an Outback deal with Maddie as well on the, on the women's basketball team. Um, so they did a pretty cool teammates program, but he had a, a couple other pretty cool brands. Um, I think he did something with Shake Shack as well. A few local deals. I think he did a. It was a great clips deal. So um, yeah, I don't think it's dependent on what he does tomorrow and hopefully on Monday night. Um, you know, there's no performance incentives. You can't do the pay for play piece to it. Uh, but will it make him? You know, in the future, you know, depending on what his uh, you know next steps are at, at the professional level, um, I think those brands can help elevate who he is and and let people know. Um, 
what he's all about. So it's been pretty cool to, you know, right at the start, he's been able to capitalize on it. And hopefully it's something that Jay can use moving forward too, right? I think, you know, for somebody who wasn't a five-star recruit coming into the program, uh, you know, for Jay to be able to to sit in a living room talking to a mom or dad or an aunt or an uncle um, and, and share the success stories that he's had from a Villanova perspective um, in, in doing it the right way, I think is a good thing. Kevin Hopkins, Don Schelke, Liam McKinnon, Liam, sorry, Cody Wilkinson, thanks to Austin. Thanks for this great panel. Could go all day on this.